So um, we have our, our first presentation from Olympia in, in Iscarsa, uh, Olympia, Ivan, and uh, Sola, who will be uh, sharing what they are, what their perspectives are for um, Iscarsa and the SDGs. Um, I will share that screen so that the, you can see it. Yeah. Oops. Uh, wait. Hold on. Uh, full screen. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. The floor is yours, Olympia. I know. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to share with you three different experiences from Russia, Nigeria, Colombia, and Japan, from ISCARC members. Um, our project has been reanalyzed with respect of the points uh, of the um, United Nations 2030 Agenda. And uh, now we are delighted to share them with you. Uh, for this reason, I invite Ivan to start this, uh, his interesting project in uh, Russia. And after Sola follows with the important experience in Nigeria. And uh, I close this presentation with the two experience between Colombia and uh, Japan. Please, Ivan. Thank you. Hello to everybody. Uh, I want to tell about two uh, historic sites that I uh, love the best um, among uh, thousands, not thousands, but uh, hundreds of uh, uh, similar historic sites that I do in Russia and one in India. <clears throat> Um, this is a site in the north of the country. It is a small island. It's called Spas Kamene. Kamen means stone. This was a small church. And uh, during the revolution in 1917, uh, it was um, destroyed. It was destroyed. Um, nevertheless, the the main cathedral, Transfiguration Cathedral, was the oldest one in the uh, very big district in the north. The belfry suffered much, but it was left uh, like a, like a thing that will help. Uh, sailors and fishermen to find their ways. The um, lake is very big. It's about 50 kilometers long and uh, 10 kilometers wide. And the island itself is very small. It's about 200 meters long and 90 uh, meters wide. Uh, all the dimensions are very approximate because it depends on the level of the water. So when we came, we saw um, remains of uh, the belfry. The belfry itself was a church too. There is a kind of this bell and uh, belfry and church. Um, uh, it's a part of Russian tradition. So uh, what we've seen when we came there, uh, the lower part of the church was damaged uh, very badly. The shock of the blast was so strong that it destroyed a uh, lower vault completely and destroyed all the uh, vaulted arches um, of uh, openings, doors openings and window openings. So when we wanted, we had um, an idea to uh, reconstruct, restore the vault. And uh, to make it, we had to uh, reconstruct the belt uh, that was inside the wall. Originally, these belts were from timber. But by the time, uh, the timber rotten completely. And uh, we could... Mm. Next. 
and we had to replace it with the reinforced concrete uh, details. Um, this is the part where the lower vault was uh, was ma was made. After that, we made we uh, restored the. Uh, the vault and uh, restored, repaired the um, this uh, walls, uh, fixing the cracks with grouting, and uh, special specially um, invented for this reinforcement. It it was so called uh, grouting with reinforcement. It's a very interesting thing. It helps uh, to make the construction more stable and to compensate the lack of uh, integrity of uh, masonry uh, in big in big cracks so uh, after that we uh, made a uh, mi more mild and more traditional reinforcement of the um, belt on the uh, next tier it was done in a more simple manner, more traditional manner, by the steel belt that was tightened with bolts and nuts. Uh, and during this, uh, uh, during uh, this work, it was heated with gas heaters. And after it uh, became normal temperature, uh, it was very tightly done. After that, it was hidden under the brickwork, under the surface brickwork. Uh, then we restored all other parts, including the uh, bell tier. And it's only a few glimpses of the story that I usually uh, talk to my students and uh, it usually take about 40, 45 minutes. Next. Uh, another part of my work, uh, it is now under, under the process, in the process, is an um, uh, ancient church, about uh, 11 or 20th century uh, church in northern Ossetia. Uh, it is a very unusual example of indirect influence of uh, seismic activity. Why indirect? Uh, because uh, due to earthquakes that are often there, the river that uh, flows at the bottom of the hill on which this church stands, uh, uh, the church, this place is about uh, two thousand two hundred meters over the sea level but this uh, hill is about uh, 30 35 meters it's made of stone gravel mostly but uh, due to the changing of the uh, flow the uh, the hill was washed away partly and uh, also partly uh, the, the part of the church was also had fallen uh, down with the landslide first part of the works took place about 12 years ago i was much younger there and more optimist we hoped that uh, hydrotechnical hydrotechnics engineers uh, will help us to restore the hill first of all, because uh, what we did was only emergency conservation works, no more. Uh, we put a belt to uh, to make this thing as one whole. Uh, we um, pumped, injected a uh, few cracks that we 
that we've seen there, and we put a kind of blanket on the slope of this damaged part of the hill in order to uh, diminish, to minimize the effect of uh, atmospheric waters. Uh, we hoped that one or two or maybe three years it will work. And after that, we expected that uh, other works of reconstructing the hill will begin, but they did not begin until now. Now, uh, there is something is is going on, and soon I am going there to control the process. We are promised to make a new, a new uh, restored river flow with a good, uh, with good protective uh, sh shores on the both sides, and to uh, to make to make the hill as it was. And uh, after that, there were different proposals. One of the proposals was, uh, after reconstructing the hill, uh, make, leave uh, the structure as it is, reinforce it, and uh, show it to tourists and to local people. But Local people told them that it was too dear for their hearts and their ancestors lived there. So they visit this place several times a year, uh, made little traditional feasts, and they wanted it as a whole. So it makes our work more, uh, more difficult and uh, in a way... Um, not so obviously good, but uh, the task is given, so we must uh, do it. So that's all. If you have question, I am ready to answer it. Ah, so uh, uh, here is the picture that shows the people who traditionally uh, gather there, drink local wine, eat uh, local goats, and. Uh, sheep and uh, make toasts for gold, God Almighty and for their ancestors. And uh, their religion is um, uh, Christianity, is uh, Orthodox Christianity, but with uh, several, uh, with some influence of uh, traditional prayer uh, Christian uh, rites. So, uh, all these uh, uh, beliefs are combined very much. So their rituals, their religious rituals, uh, rituals uh, they often end with great feast. And by the way, almost each feast where I took part in, they were looking, they were sounding like um, a sermon, like a religious sermon too. So uh, that's how it's proposed to be look like. So the uh, original part will have different color. Uh, all original stones will be uh, saved as it is. Uh, the, the roof is uh, very easily um, calculated its dimensions, its height, and uh, also it's very easily uh, to do uh, with the missing part. So uh, maybe next time I will tell you how it uh, all worked out. I hope so. I'm ready for questions, if there are. Sola. Thank you, Ivan. Okay, okay, I go to next. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ivan. Yeah, thank you, Gabe. Um, so uh, I, I, just, I was going to give like a brief uh, introduction to uh, like an overview of the projects I'll be showing. And I, I think it was really nice that I heard Larry's presentation because uh, it's kind of a, 
necessary, it was a necessary thing for me to hear because it kind of drove home uh, the ideals and concepts I've had to work with uh, in Nigeria specifically. Uh, and essentially, if if your project, your cultural heritage project, doesn't have any quantitative benefits or quantitative outputs, results, or whatever, you, you just, you know, are not going to get any support or any traction from anybody, you know, from people volunteering, from the end users, from uh, government support, private sector. Nobody's going to help you if it doesn't in any way, you know, impact tangibly, you know, and, and, and economically on the surrounding. Uh, because for us, uh, there's a lot we're dealing with. Uh, one, the fact that bulk of what is left as heritage is actually colonial heritage. So I get a lot of comments, you know, telling me, oh, why are you doing this? This is not African heritage. This is not Nigerian heritage. And I tell them that this is just a means to an end. I have to give an excuse to say, you know, we're learning the principles and we hope to carry it on and try to restore some of our pre-colonial cultural heritage sites and practices and all of that. Uh, and then as well, cultural heritage is not uh, anywhere near the top of uh, the priorities for, for a government like Nigeria because uh, there's health. You know, I think uh, Gabe mentioned earlier, there's the fact that you need to get food, you need to get health, you need to get... Um, you know, sustenance, general basic needs. So cultural heritage is essentially a luxury, <laughs> you know, really. Uh, it's this artistic, foreign, you know, thing that people do. And so we had to find a middle ground where all of this work impacted people on ground. So right here, the image I have here, uh, or the collage I have here on the bottom left, for us was strongly about education, so we opened up the museum uh, to school visits, specifically focused on children, primary school children. And, uh, you know, they just love it because what happens is, uh, well, essentially we're located in the railway museum and, you know, in the, the railway museum is located in the railway compound. And so what happens is the railway takes them on a short trip uh, for them to experience the trains that don't really run much, but are, being, are coming back now in Nigeria. And after the trip, the bus brings them to the museum and they have a full day experience of things where they have to write notes, learn as part of their coursework. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really impactful because I think in terms of data, at a point, after working on this for about five, six years, we stopped someday when we were preparing a proposal to a potential funder and they asked us for data and then we had to go back and look at our register and at the end of the day we realized that we hosted about 120,000 children in a year and that is huge because you know even regular or contemporary museums and galleries don't do such numbers so it was really good for us to go into the data aspect of things and get out that uh, um, um, information. And as you see at the bottom left, I also wrote that we've kind of created multi multiplicity in terms of the functions of the space because uh, originally uh, you know, the, the man who restored the building, my, my former professor in Unilag, uh, John Godwin, restored the building and they put a museum in there because that was the mandate. But the museum wasn't able to sustain itself. Nobody used to come to the museum and you couldn't charge more than what the national museums, which were being subsidized by government, were charging. And so we had to create a what I'll call a financial sustainability plan. And essentially that for us was about developing the grounds. You know, this house was the house of the general manager of the railways, was built in 1898. And the guy was getting paid higher than the governor general of the colony because he was the business head of the colony and you know the grounds were, were built to fit so he has large grounds and we got to work all of us by the way we're all volunteers and we came started digging shoveling and all of that and if you look at the picture on the bottom right um the expatriates because there's a lot of expatriates in lagos 
you know, working in the oil sector, in the hospitality, all kinds of things. Once they saw our call out mm -hmm. on Instagram and on Facebook, they all came because Lagos is, you know, as you all probably have the impression, is unsafe. But we had this incubated and safe space that was a cultural heritage space. And most of these guys, I think about two of them are British and they're coming back to a British house, you know, to work. And so we had a lot of them expatriates coming on board and before you knew it we had a garden up and running and the garden just attracted all the nigerian people because they then came for photo shoots for music video shoots for movie shoots for weddings parties picnics all kinds of things and what we have now is a space uh or uh, two spaces that basically complement each other because people who then come for events ask us oh, what, what is happening in there and we tell them it's a museum, and then they pay to see the museum. So I think um, just to go over the four tiles that I put at the top, uh, yeah, good health and well-being. We, in Lagos, you know, people who know Lagos here, all the trees are taken down. You know, you have just hardscape everywhere, tall buildings, hard concrete floors, coal tar roads and everything. So this, you know, represents like a safe haven, for people who did the hustle and bustle of Lagos, who still do that. And on the weekends or after work, they then come here for a museum tour. And we find that people don't want to leave. In fact, we had to start charging like an extra fee for you if you want to sit down at the garden for about an hour or two after your museum tour. And people pay because, you know, they can't find this elsewhere. And then the quality of education, of course, like the kids have shown, you know, at a point history was taken out of the curriculum you know, for all kinds of political reasons, but they always got a good dose of history here because we also had things that were not just related to the railways and artifacts and pictures and all of that. Uh, sustainable cities and communities, the immediate environment of this place was greatly impacted by the work we did because anytime we hosted an event, we just got all the market women selling things around to come into the space and they became our vendors for free. And they made more money because more people, you know, they had a larger uh, target market than they typically would. Uh, partnerships for the goals. When we started, you can go to the next slide, Gabe. When we started the Legacy Project or the Jekyll House Project, we definitely did not have any money at all. All we had were the sites that were given to us by the Railway Corporation in their 100th year. So we were like a centenary anniversary declaration of protection of four sites. And so in the beginning, we just used to have partners come, okay, I want to do this, I want to do that. And we said, you know what, don't give us any money. Just use the space for free, clean it up, pay for utilities, and promote the site. So at the beginning, we had to develop a foundation on partnerships. You know? So till today, we still do that. And this next slide is another building in the railway compound. Uh, it's actually the main museum. It's where the steam engines used to get repaired and they just wheeled in from wherever or towed in. And if you can see in the middle right bottom corner, there's a steam engine still there that, you know, we hope to restore and we're very close to that. But it's been a lot of work. And uh, essentially, we have four steam engines in there just sitting there, no protection at all. In fact, we have squatters living in there and we've had to come up with a, well, I say, partnership scheme with them where they live there and they clean up the place and keep it, you know, nice and tidy. Uh, and um, what we had to do, like I said earlier, was to partner with all kinds of institutions. On the bottom left, the picture with the fabric things up, up, up on the roof, that was done by some students of the University of Applied Arts in Vienna. They came to do like a workshop session, spent two weeks uh, in the museum Jekyll House and working from here. The next slide on the bottom, with the food train thing was this uh, whiskey brand, uh, Jameson. They came to do an event in this huge space and uh, they used one of the old coaches for vendors who were selling food because, you know, the ergonomics worked really well. Uh, and uh, the same event is at the picture, the night scene on the top right, where you have like a crowd of people who are just, you know, having fun in this cultural heritage space, you know, very bad shape, but the frame structure is solid and has been solid for about 120 years. And it was a good time. You know, I was in the front there somewhere myself, 
but it was a good way for young people who are totally disconnected from this whole colonial heritage building to engage with this space. And, uh, you know, all sorts of benefits came out of that. The green web-like thing on the bottom is also one of the results of the interventions by the students from uh, Austria. And all of these gave us, you know, good marketing leverage because all the people who came for these events, you know, came to do next came to bring new events that got us money. Next slide, please, Gabe. Um, I think I have one last slide. Sola, okay. yeah. Sola, sorry, you have only one minute. Yeah, so this is not even my project, but I needed to show it because this is a colleague from Togo. The old colonial palace of uh, Togo has been converted now by the government into an arts and cultural center open to all the kids worked on by 10 different professionals who are Togolese, local professionals, and they've done a great job. So you need to Google that and find more about it. And I'll hand over to Olympia. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so, um, in Japan, next, next. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, in Japan, um, we have, uh, I'm, um, Sorry, in Japan at Sado Island, in, in collaboration with the Niigata Prefecture, we are working on an interesting project that aims to involve the local community to understand the enhance of the traditional houses and the cultural landscape. Next, please. In Sado Island, we are working very much with the local community, especially a special activity for the enhancement of the rural area and the ancient mines of gold and silver. The main aims are, are, is um, to improve the quality of education above all the, the young generation, the welfare and the, the development of the local community. Also with the important project finalized to restore the national traditional houses. Next, please. Uh, in Colombia, in uh, these uh, last few years, I realized many activities, academic activities, uh, to approach the local community to the values of the cultural heritage. In uh, these specific cases, when the, the uh, University of Ibagué in the Tolima department, I realized a first project to restore a railway station built in 1920 and after uh, 1915 uh, was abandoned. Uh, next, please. Uh, thanks to this project, the local community has been involved and today this ancient railway station is an important cultural house where um, a small with uh, also with a small uh, library and many many spaces for cultural activities and this space has been important to enhance the, the local cultural heritage next please um, in the East Kark, um, community International Scientific Committee, the goals of Agenda 2030 were not analyzed, and uh, this opportunity is well uh, to start this path together and to reanalyze many important projects of our members with a new perspective. For this reason, um, our idea is promote many important activity in the next few years above promotion of Agenda 2030, also to organize a specific course. For example, at my university, I'm working and I'm organizing a specific class on Agenda 2030. Also promote in meetings to revitalizing and regenerating generating these procedures in according with the Agenda 2030. Thank you so much and sorry for our delay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much. I think that was good. Uh, the, the different kinds of um, projects that you, you had, uh, particularly, you know, having education and 
uh, community engagement are really the thing, the core of that kind of sustainable development. Um, things see. that, yeah. And, you know, uh, as Sola has said, right, if you uh, lack money, then that's the time that creativity comes in. And then you discuss, uh, create, uh, have more partnerships and make heritage work for more people. Um, we can have some questions for, for later. And then uh, we just go to Ecomos Philippines first and their presentation for um, the work that the, they're thinking of. Um, Kenneth, um, it's time to share the slides. Yes. If you can show your face, that will be good as well. Yeah. I'm going to turn on my, my, my camera after the presentation due to internet purposes. Um, can you see the screen now? Yes. Okay, great. Yes, we can see the screen, yeah. Great. Okay. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, to all of ICOMAS members worldwide. Um, as ICOMAS Philippines, we will be presenting our introduction as a current three-member committee on the Sustainable Development Goals Working Group. The outline for this presentation is first introduction of the members and presentation of their case studies. Second, we will be tackling the brief contribution of, of ICOMOS Philippines to the SDGs. And third, we will be, it will be the, the brief presentation of our three-year plan for the working group. To start, I will introduce each member. The first member is Mrs. Chandra Ismancias. She is a tourism and environmental planner who has been providing technical assistance to local governments, NGOs, national government agencies, and private companies to on tourism planning and ecotourism development for almost 20 years. She is a graduate of tourism, environmental education, and urban and regional planning. She authored several planning tools designed to provide a more pragmatic approach to the planning process. She is also into tourism product development that capitalizes on both the natural and cultural assets of a destination. She advocates responsible travel, heritage conservation, and community-based approaches in planning. The second member and one of the emerging professionals, or DPP, is landscape architect Chris Justine Agugalino. She is part of the Philippine Association of Landscape Architects, or PALA, and is an active as the PALA Philippine Landscape Architecture Standards for Special Committee. And international level, she is also a member of International Federation of Landscape Architects, or IFLA. She is also an environmental planner and is part of the Philippine Institute of Environmental Planners, or PIEP. And she is a certified professional and assessor for the Philippine Green Building Council, Building for Ecologically Responsive Design Excellence, or BERTE program. And lastly, yours truly, I am Kenneth Tua, I'm an architect and a sustainable territorial development consultant. I am currently finishing my Erasmus Mundus joint master's degree in dynamics of cultural landscape, heritage, memory, and conflictualities, and master of arts in cultural diplomacy and international relations. I am also a fellow at Young Sustainable Impact Southeast Asia and an expert consultant on sustainability at Campus Erasmus Mundus Incorporation. Now we are going to proceed with our case studies and projects for the SDGs, and I will start first. Okay, um, for me, I've been participating in sustainable development and sustainability innovation fellowships as a scholar, contributing to the SDGs through design thinking and idea innovation for stakeholder, stakeholders in the public, private, NGO, and government sectors throughout Asia. Two of those projects are related are directly related to cultural heritage and two are indirectly related. Now, these ideations are centered on the promotion of cultural heritage and its ripple effects to social economic advancements. Afterwards, the turnover of projects to stakeholders for are done for implementation or application to current programs and practices. The first image on the left is in Thailand, the second is in Singapore, the third is in South Korea, and the fourth is in Manila in Asian Development Bank. Now, furthermore, I've been doing information dissemination of the 70 sustainable development goals with touches on cultural heritage and by providing talks and seminars on HEIs and government agencies. This includes highlights. I would like to also highlight my work in the Pasig River Rehabilitation Commission. Um, it, 
that then, and now it's called PRCMO, for the protection of urban landscapes. And recently, um, I've contributed to the baseline pilot study on the first and new specialization on landscape heritage conservation education through ICOMAS Philippines in the Philippines. And next will be um, Ms. Ogalina and her case studies, followed by Mrs. Mencias. Hello, everyone. So I have been a part of the science program in my academic years and have collaborated with researchers on easing dehydration of unhosted rice or rice grains with portability availability of resources and less, less cost, making use of plant fiber as an additive for bricks and assessing native trees as, re as replacement candidates for a campus streetscape. In my professional years, apart from supervising projects and developments, I have been contributing to my professional organizations in the publication of Philippine Landscape Architecture Standards, which are envisioned to involve the SDGs and green developments, and in crafting guidelines for the recognition of the specific efforts of local government units with the SDGs. Uh, can you proceed with the next slide, Ken? Uh, I've also worked on written projects such as the revitalization of a transportation hub and the promotion of an outdoor experience-based educational facility to foster out-of-school youths and developments such as economic zones, coastal subdivisions, uh, consultancies for coastal subdivisions for native tree selection, and information dissemination on landscape architecture environmental planning, and uh, green buildings or developments. Thank you. And now next is Ms. Ms. Jen Mencias. Uh, hello. Good morning or good evening to everyone, wherever you are. Um, my name is Jen Mencias, and I've been providing technical assistance to local governments for the last 20 years. And in my line of work, uh, my responsibility is to make sure that whatever plans that we, uh, we create are anchored on sustainable development principles. However, uh, my realization is that if you go down to the level of the communities, there's no clear articulation of this specific uh, SDG goals. And so in the last two projects that I, I facilitated, I, 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 I made a, um, a conscious effort to articulate or explain to my clients how uh, each of the goals are uh, relevant to tourism development. So my specialization is tourism development and I, I am more biased towards community-based approach. And um, in the last three years, or um, three years ago, rather, I had a chance to write six uh, books about six protected areas in the province of Aurora. And it's, it's a story about ecology, but relating uh, the lives of indigenous people in the equation and how uh, indigenous knowledge plays a role in, in uh, heritage conservation but more particularly uh, natural heritage. Um, it is, it, we are, we are um, consciously um, advocating for a more clear understanding of the SDG goals uh, with, with regards to tourism planning because here in the Philippines, um, the national government is merely adopting economic indicators uh, as, a me as metrics for assessing status of tourism development in destinations. So I'm embarking on a legacy project where we will be partnering with different institutions to be able to uh, generate different indicators across different dimensions of the tourism development uh, paradigm so that we can compute for tourism development capacity index. And so this entails a more clear understanding of the sustainable, sustainable development goals. And so it will be a challenge for us to bring it down to the level of the community. But I think this is long overdue. 
because uh, we have seen many destinations in the country going um, downhill and declining because of the lack of understanding of these goals. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, about three years ago, um, I got involved with a fishing community uh, wherein uh, these communities have uh, this intangible heritage that goes uh, all the way back to their ancestors. And this fishing community conducts this ritual, fishing ritual, every year at the start of uh, March. And uh, three years ago, they told me that they don't have the funding anymore to continue with the ritual, even though it's been going on for more than 100 years, simply because they don't have the money anymore. And because these are poor fishing communities. And so I said, because I was, I was involved in facilitating the tourism master planning project for the entire uh, province of Batanes, and it's a protected landscape and seascape. And so I said that there is a way to link um, protecting or cons conserving your intangible heritage with tourism. Why don't we come up with an experiential uh, package or product where we invite limited number of tourists to uh, witness the ritual? Because it, it, ever since they started this ritual, um, it's, it's a private ritual that's not really open to the public. And so I said, maybe we can do it in a limited and controlled manner and have strict rules and protocols at the same time, generate the fund that you need to be able to continue with the ritual. And so the first year that we did that, it was really experimental, but the result was so positive that they continued doing that in the next two years until this year, actually, even with the pandemic, we were able to raise uh, enough money donated by tourists who were not there because there was no tourism, but they provided the funds so that the ritual will continue. And so I realized that there's, um, there's really a um, possible connection between um, tourism and heritage conservation as long as authenticity is preserved and uh, strict protocols are, in, are established so that uh, the ritual, uh, the, the integrity of the rituals or any, any uh, intangible heritage are preserved. So next slide, please. Uh, about in 2014, uh, again, this is in Batanes, the same, same place where uh, the Mataos uh, uh, live. Uh, I got involved with uh, the Department of Environment and Natural Resources to develop the business plan, ecotourism business plan for a community of Ibatans uh, who live in these stone houses, age old uh, houses that have been there for more than a hundred years. And I realized that uh, many of these people living in this, in this community don't have the funds to maintain the houses and some of them are already dilapidated. And so, and, and they, were, they, they don't also have the resources coming from the government. So I learned that there's no baseline as to how many houses are dilapidated and what are the status. And so um, apart from my formal engagement of coming up with a business plan, I decided to venture in a personal project where I developed a tool to assess uh, the, these houses in this community based on different parameters. And I translated the result of that, of that assessment into a GIS map, as you, you see here on the left side, it's color coded. And you will see that uh, the the red ones, the red ones are, are are the ones that are preserved, while the rest are in different states of uh, dilapida dilapidation. So I I think that um, by showing this to the national or by showing this to provincial government, it uh, it was an eye opener that. Uh, they realize that they have to do something to be able to save this, this uh, valuable heritage, which actually is the very reason why tourists are coming to, to Batanes. And I'm hoping later on this, this, that this kind of project can be funded so that it can be replicated in the other communities within that province. So that's it.
Ken. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Ocalino and Ms. Mencias. And now we'll be discussing Dicomus Philippines and the SDGs. Okay. For the past eight years, Dicomus Philippines has briefly touched the SDGs and we will present projects and engagements for each SDG. Now, um, even though that uh, SDG has been brought to in 2015, we know that sustainable development has been there since 1987. So this presentation is ICOMOS Philippines and Sustainable Development from 2013 2002, to 2021. For SDG 1, um, ICOMOS Philippines has provided partnership on providing heritage activities and community development in local neighborhood. Here, uh, I, um, as our partnership, we provided food and sanitary and fire prevention courses for the local neighborhood. For SDG 2, we had, and also one, we, ha we had a webinar on taste making and food security. And here we would like to highlight our main member engagement with Moline Chocolat by our member, Ms. Estela Duki with Cablon Farmers of Barangay Puna. For SDG 3, um, we had a discussion to explore collective strategies to adapt two new challenges amidst the global pandemic through the heritage amidst, uh, practice amidst COVID-19 webinar, wherein we discuss shared heritage, shared responsibility, and shared culture. For SDG4, we have been providing seminars that have um, speakers both international and local in cooperation with higher education institutions. We also hosted relevant discussion on heritage by pairing ICOMOS PH members with students to present theses. Now for this one, although it's not our project, but it is part, um, it is a project but, uh, by our very close partner, Philippine Association of Landscape Architects, wherein our dear member, which is also here, Dr. Edson Cabalfin, um, had been invited to have a discussion on the series about centered on Philippine queer spaces. And also today we have him um, honorably to present for us. And this is a place wherein ICOMAS PH will be good to um, or to, be, to express a, a greater change or to recalibrate our strategies to further add more to this SDG. For SDG 6, we have been addressing issues and have been creating a platform for discourse through, again, our pacemaking food security webinar, including the available information about water scarcity on local communities. Also, again, another um, out of Agamos Philippines um, topic, it is the highlights on member engagements through PALA, again, on the discussion using Dolomites as pitch nourishment strategy for the revelation of Manila Bay by one of our dear members, which is landscape architect Paolo G. Alcazar. For SDG 7, we have given talks that briefly touch the importance of green building practices to promote solar power utilization and improving energy productivity in heritage related projects. Now, for SDG 8, we have been equipping professionals with field school, pro uh, field school programs like this, and we've been invade, um, inviting notable speakers and mentors to collaborate, such as the seismic retrofit of unreinforced masonry heritage to churches in the Philippines. On the same projects, we have also SDG 9, where we recapacitate people with innovative technology, such as photogrammetry and lighting and acoustic design for existing and historic buildings. And again, the same for SDG 10. We have been providing scholarship for outstanding aspiring heritage practitioners and contri thus contributing to inclusivity. For SDG 11, we have been providing CPD seminars that provides training for sustainable urban development and on-ground discourse with professionals practicing sustainability and its challenges. For SDG 12, after the food security webinar, our dear members, Mr. Caballero, Ms. Paterno, and Ms. Duque have synthesized this into a document. And also, uh, we have an highlights on member engagement through the Sustainable Sagada Initiative, which is called now as Sustainable Towns, for helping fresh produce reach consumers during the COVID-19 by our member, Ms. Patricia Maria Santiago, which is also featured in CNN. For SG, SDG 13, we also provide conferences on human security through by supporting climate campaign. And in connection with that, for SDG 14, 
through this, we promote sustainable tourism with, of course, highlights engagements by our by Mrs. Chen Min Sias on conserving ocean-based resources and marine protected areas. For SDG 15, we have been advocating to the protection of heritage trees and cultural landscapes, with also highlights on member engagements to on tree conservation by Dr. Susan Aquino Ong. For SDG 16, we have been releasing joint statements to maintain peace in the country's cultural heritage and to integrate mutual understanding. I think, if I'm not mistaken, the first joint statement that we released was the Rizal Memorial Sports Complex of being turned into a commercial hub. But thankfully, it was um, conserved. And now, it has, it, if I'm not mistaken, it, it has been used for the Southeast Asian Games and has been properly well been restored to its former glory. And for SDG 17, we have a strong cooperation with public and private stakeholders in the protection of heritage, as well as improving access to knowledge and ideas through joint projects. And one of those is the Philippine Heritage Chapter. For the international level, I come as, uh, we have contributed to the policy guidance by providing feedbacks for the second overall document consultation and have provided a case study for SDG 11, thus highlighting ACOMA's Philippine efforts. Now, since the conception of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, ACOMA's Philippines was not able to fully integrate and align its programs and activities to the 17 SDGs. Albeit, the 2030 Agenda has briefly touched many of our projects throughout the years, this is an opportunity for the organization to recalibrate and prioritize further these goals, achieving a more localized approach in the protection of the Philippines' cultural and natural heritage for the SDGs. The good news um, with this is that we, we are going to present to you the 2021 to 2023 working plan for, for three years. Launch a campaign with branding of sustainable development goals for cultural and natural heritage, Pamana 2030, Pamana which means inheritance or heritage in Filipino. Create a nationwide database for SDGs, activities and innovation centered on Philippine heritage. Encourage an integration of the SDGs in all of ICOMA's PH projects and progress programs until 2030. This is for internal. And collaboration with development actors on the mo mobilization of Philippine heritage for SDGs for external. Writing a research on Philippine cultural tourism and the SDGs through the initiative of Ms. Mencias and Mr. Caballero. And last but not the least, produce a localized policy guidance entitled as Philippine Cultural Heritage and the Sustainable Development Goals, Policy Guidance for Heritage and All Development Actors. The good news with this working plan is that it has been given prelim preliminary approval by a common speech board and we are currently internally final, finalizing the final proposal to be submitted to ICOMA's PH board. Now, it is targeted to start this May 2021 until August 2023 in celebration of ICOMA's Philippines 35th and Coral anniversary since its, its, uh, its establishment. And that includes our presentation. On behalf of the ICOMA's PH SDGs Working Group, we would like to thank everyone for their time and kind attention and have a nice day. Okay, thank you very much, Ken. I think that was uh, quite a lot of uh, information that has been given for quite a short time. But I, 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 well, I'm a little bit biased, to be honest, because, uh, I mean, for, for me, I've seen this work, and uh, congratulations to the team who has put it together. What I just want to highlight there is that uh, what Ecomos Philippines is doing is looking back at uh, the activities that has been done. So, so that the, the heritage and sustainable development are seen in the same lens. So it is not really that, that um, if you think that the, the work that you do is not related to the sustainable development, and when you look back and see, it is actually possible to link uh, some of that work. And I, I do hope that the, uh, uh, we as a, a working group uh, reflect on our work and see how, how we can do that um, together, right? Okay. Um, um, do we have any uh, pertinent questions to the, the presenters um, uh, that we have, uh, particularly to Iskarsa and um, Ikumas Philippines? Okay, I have a question for Sola. Well, if uh, people are thinking of a question, Sola, um, for your case study, um, are you are you still here? Are you still here, Sola? Okay. Hi, Gabriel. Yeah, okay, yes. 
so you're still here, right? So question, um, with regards to, to the, your, your Jekyll house, uh, I know that there are a lot of challenges that you, you face. And do you think that um, having, um, uh, let's say, the heritage is, became a means of having a background for a lot of more or activities, you know, they're, they're of uh, not just valorizing the heritage space, but also celebrating it in different ways? How do you think that can be done more? Um, thank you for the question. <laughs> Quite uh, thought provoking because, uh, you know, and I think I mentioned that for us, uh, it can't, the heritage, at least of this particular project, can't be the center because it is colonial. And uh, because this is just about, uh, you mean, we got our independence in 1960, you know, we're just about 60 years away from that. It's difficult for us to see this as um, something nice or our heritage because we had a very subjective role in that and, you know, all of the painful past and whatnot. So we had to almost relegate the actual heritage for this project and for British colonial projects that I've worked on in such a way that what brings people to the sites is something else entirely. And then when they come and they feel comfortable in the sites, they eventually get to see the heritage. But then what we're promoting is not British heritage. Of course, the building is, and the overall narrative is, but the content that is in there is purely, and we ensure that we make sure that it is purely Nigerian, purely local. And as much as possible, we try to put pre-colonial narratives and artifacts in there because we don't have those available almost anywhere you know there's a big gap for pre-colonial heritage and we make the point to make it clear to people that what we're doing is not is not the end you know we're going through the colonial heritage because you know it's our heritage it's part of the story but we're not just going to stop there we're going all the way back to pre-colonial heritage so as much as possible we do a lot of pre-colonial cultural events and things like that and you know just try to attract people in with other things because you know nobody you know appreciates history that well because you know even the national the local one too many people don't know about it but we use the british one that is more visual that is more widely seen to bring them in and then bring in the other pre-colonial content I don't know if that answers your question yeah. somehow. Great. I think it's, it's basically you're saying that there's a lot more content that, that can be uh, utilized uh, oh, yes. uh, within one site. Right? Oh, so, yes. Oh, yes. Um, uh, last question for, for e-commerce Philippines. Now, I, I, I've seen this presentation, but I just wanted to ask uh, Chen if you're still here. Um, with regards to um, uh, financial um, issues, uh, is Chen still around? Um, uh, I think um, both of them have, are gone. Because okay. They be somewhere. Well, they, then, then the question is, Ken, uh, for, for you, um, thanks for, for what you've done. So uh, I think it's time to talk to our policy guidance team. Uh, Ege is here and, and uh, get in touch with Linda because the, the policy guidance and interpreting it to the local context is something that our policy guidance team is quite interested in. And I do hope that uh, not just Ecomos Philippines does it, but uh, a lot of uh, other people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so you will get in touch in the future. Thank you very much, Sergio. Okay. With that said, um, thank you very much, and have a good afternoon, good morning, good afternoon, and give the evening.